Welcome to Catholic Conversations. This is your host, Adrian Fonseca, and today is the Feast of St. Dominic. Yes, Holy Father St. Dominic. And so we're going to read the Sermon of St. Vincent Ferrer on the Feast of St. Dominic. And who is this amazing man, St. Dominic? But we are also going to be talking about the history of the translation of his feast, because his feast day was originally August 5th, then it went to August 4th, then it went to August 8th. And so if you're following the traditional calendar, today is the feast, August 4th, of St. Dominic. If you are following the new calendar, then that would be August 8th. So that's why there might be a little discrepancy depending on who you are and what calendar you follow. So, but anyway, we're going to talk St. Dominic. It's going to be great. And before I move any further, I always forget to tell people, make sure to like, subscribe, hit the bell notification and all that other jazz. People comment down below, whatever it is that people need to do. I always forget to do, to ask for those kind of things until like the end. And so, you know. It is what it is. But without further ado, let's talk St. Dominic. And first, let's begin in a prayer from the Dominican Rite Mass for August 4th, the collect for today. We're going to start off with that prayer and then go into the sermon of St. Vincent Frere. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. O oh God, you were play- pleased to enlighten your church with the merits and teaching of Blessed Dominic, you are confessor and our Father. Grant at his intercession that she may not be wanting in temporal help and may always increase in spiritual growth through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Loving Father Dominic. Be mindful of your work and standing before the Supreme Judge. Plead for your poor clients. Amen. And the Sermon of St. Vincent Ferrer for today. Hopefully I'm not blocking it too much. Probably am. The Sermon for St. Vincent Ferrer today is on the Gospel of Matthew. The reason why it's the Gospel of Matthew today is because on the old calendar, St. Dominic was categorized amongst the doctors of the church because he is the doctor of the Dominican order. And so they, whenever they're celebrating his feast, in fact, they would uh, celebrate him as a doctor. So very fascinating little tidbit there, but we are going to go. So the the gospel is Matthew 5, 13. I'm not going to read the whole gospel to you. If you would like to read the gospel and that's, uh, you can go there and read that gospel. But the important part is the fact that it is his, that is the, uh, the feast, the preaching of the, uh, the gospel for doctors. That's the important point that we should note. So the feast of St. Dominic, you are the salt of the earth. This is a text to be read at today's gospel, just as the whole office in the solemnity of the present day is about the most glorious father and confessor of our Lord, St. Dominic. So also is our sermon. God willing, we shall have many good teachings. But first, let the Virgin Mary be held. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The theme for some explanation of this text in the introduction to the aforesaid material, it must be known that all corporeal visible creatures, which in this world have one task in general, namely to represent and signify spiritual and invisible things. And this is one of the more principal reasons. Why did God create the world to represent invisible and spiritual things? The reason is because as long as we live in this life and are mortal, we cannot see spiritual things but through figures and like representations. This defect is on the part of flesh which impedes because it can see only corporeal things. It is like someone who would hold green sapphires or rubies in front of his eyes, and whatever he sees would be green or red. It is not a defect on the part of the eyes but from the unknowing glass or gems, which view reality only through its own color. So it is with us. The eyes of the soul have a body like a sapphire, and so they can see only corporeal things. But putting down the sapphires, namely the flesh, immediately they see spiritual things, angels and souls. See the defect? And so it is that in this life, we do not see spiritual things. And this is the common teaching in philosophy in the third part of De Anima and in theology, the philosopher, the philosopher, Aristotle says, it is impossible for us to understand except through phantasms, i.e. likeness. 
In theology, also Dionysius, the Areopagite, says, It is impossible for us otherwise to see divine light unless it was covered over by a veil of images. Because of this, God, knowing that spiritual things cannot be seen by us in this world, created the world in which each creature, howsoever tiny, represents the figure's spiritual things. For example, none of you ever sees Christ nor the Virgin Mary, nor one of the apostles in this world. So a skilled painter paints images not to be adored, but to represent Christ, the Virgin Mary, and the other saints. And so God, the most clever artist of all, paints this world like an easel filled with representational images. And so the apostle says, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made his eternal power also and divinity, so that they are inexcusable. This teaching, therefore, is clear enough through reason and authority that all corporeal creatures have seen the same general task. So Christ wished that the invisible and spiritual perfection of the apostles and of those following the apostolic life be prefigured through one corporeal creature, namely by salt. And so Christ says to the apostles and those following the apostolic life, and especially to St. Dominic, our father, you are the salt of the earth. The theme is clear now. Next, the material which I want to preach to you, salt. I have noticed, therefore, three properties in salt through which it signifies to me the apostles and especially St. Dominic, our father. First, salt heals infections. Second, salt preserves from corruption. Third, it delights us when we eat. From these three conditions, salt represents St. Dominic. And so it is said to him, you are the salt of the earth. Heals infections. First, I say that salt heals infections. About this in 4 Kings chapter 2, the text says that the holy prophet and friend of God, Elisha, came to the city of Jericho, and the officials and rulers of this city came to him, saying to him that this, this, that, that city was noble and beautiful, having good lands, but it had a defect, because the waters, he said, are polluted and make the land sterile, the bloat and bloat the people who drink of the water. And so, Father, you who are so holy and a friend of God, are you able to take care of this and provide a remedy? The prophet responded, it pleases me, give me a new pitcher. And when they brought the pitcher, he said, now I need salt. When they brought, then they brought it, he sprinkled it on the waters. When he did this, he said, thus says the Lord, I have healed these waters. The waters were healed on that day, according to the words of Elisha, which is found in 4 Kings chapter 2. Here are four secrets to be revealed. First, that it is the city of Jericho. Second, what are these infected waters? Third, what is this new pitcher? Fourth, what is this salt healing and purifying the waters? Jericho. The city of Jericho signifies the church. Jericho, according to the Hebrew meaning, stands for moon. Behold, universal Christianity, namely the church, rightly passes through the phases of the moon. For in the moon, we find seven phases or states. The first is the new moon, second is waxing, third full, fourth waning, and the fifth in the, is the moon turning around, the sixth is eclipsing, seventh will be the perfect moon. The same for the church. First, it was like the new moon in the time of the apostles because then Christianity first appeared and strict, and then the Christians went about simply. There was little of the great pridefulness or vanities in the prelates like now. Second, next it was waxing. In the time of the martyrs, because many were converted because of the miracles, which they were performing. And so the church increased. Third, in the time of the holy doctors, it was full. For from their preaching and teachings and examples of holiness, they illuminated the whole world. In the time of Augustine, all of Africa was Christian. Fourth, it was waning. At the time when the religious orders of preachers and minors began, because they, because then, because of sin, they would have perished suddenly and quickly, and so these religious orders came to correct those sins. The fifth phase is rotating. When the moon rotates, it is not seen for two or three days, and so it is now. Almost no obedience is shown to the Pope. Some are saying that the Pope is above the council, others the opposite. Sixth, it shall be eclipsed, and this is a time of the Antichrist, because then it shall appear to be dead. Just as some simply folk, simple folks say, when the moon is eclipsed, that it died and would appear bloody all over. 
Such shall be the time of the Antichrist, because the outpouring of Christian blood. Seventh, after the death of Antichrist, it shall be perfect, because then all shall return to the faith of Christ. Behold the phases of the church, and so the church is signified by Jericho, i.e. the moon. About this last phase, David says, as the moon perfect forever and a faithful witness in heaven. Psalm 88, 38. Infected waters. Second, we must see that these infected waters of the city are. These waters are the vices, sins, and wicked manner of living of Christians. Because before the coming of St. Dominic, all peoples were infected. The faithful were given to forgetfulness. Virtues were held in contempt. About this, the apocalypse. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. New picture. But Elisha said, let's have a new picture. Behold, the order of preachers is called a pitcher because it is made up of many brothers. It is called new and old, more so than all the other orders. If we wish to speak with respect to the essential vows, which are angelic chastity, apostolic or evangelical poverty and general obedience. And so for the office of preaching, which is to travel about through the world, not to construct buildings. This is the religious order of St. Dominic. As to its essentials, Christ already ordained all this. Christ was the first because St. Thomas says in Secunda Secunda question 88, article four, that the apostles leaving everything to follow Christ vowed pertaining to the state of perfection from which is implies that they vowed these, namely chastity, poverty, and obedience to Christ. The same regarding the office of preaching. He commanded them saying, go into the whole world and preach the gospel to every creature. Behold the religious order of Christ. It is the very same as that of St. Dominic. Therefore, we have and we embrace three vows, namely angelic chastity, evangelical poverty, complete obedience, so that anyone of this order watch out for himself. So go preaching, don't settle down in one place. And so the story of St. Dominic goes. He thought to institute an order, which would be called the order of preaching brothers, and would so be. Behold, therefore, how it is a very old religious order and a good religious observing religious observing these on the day of judgment, when kings and great prelates shall stand on the earth with others. He himself shall stand with the apostles, elevated with the judge with Christ. Oh, what an honor this shall be. Here is the answer to a lit litigious question between clergy and religious. The clergy say that they were the original religious order, which is not so. For there were no clergy until Holy Thursday. Yet there were religious before, namely the apostles, who had taken the aforesaid vows. But the religious order of St. Dominic is called a new pitcher or vessel with respect to ceremonies. We wear black kappas and white scapulars, also that we eat in our refectory and similar things. With respect to these ceremonies, it is a new vessel. About this vessel, we can say that Christ said of, of Paul, who was the first in the office of preaching, First, that is principal and ultimate with respect to the vocation to the apostolate. The man, this man is to me a vessel of election to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings. Salt. Fourth, we must find the meaning of salt in the vessel. It is this. Dominic in the vessel of the order from its first property because salt heals from infection. So St. Dominic placed in a new vessel heals the infections of the sick, the sins of the world. For the whole world was infected with great envy of one another. But St. Dominic comes preaching the love of God and neighbor. And God prefigured this. For his mother saw in dreams that she would bear a dog with a blazing torch in his mouth, who emerging from her womb seemed to set fire to the whole world. She was amazed at this and enlightened by God said that her son would be a great watchdog for the flock of Christ, who would bark at the wolves of hell. With fire in his mouth, he was to inflame the world to the love of God and neighbor. He also heals from infection of lust because the infection of this sin before the coming of St. Dominic was so great that almost no one was clean. But St. Dominic came preaching chastity and poverty and peoples responded with devotion. This too God had already prefigured because his godmother had a vision of St. Dominic having a star on his forehead, which lit up the whole earth with its light. Stunned, the godmother joyfully told of her vision. And this is implied that just as a star is pure and bright, so he should lead peoples to the brightness and purity of chastity. Also, the whole world was infected with pride. 
pomp, and vanity. But at the preaching and teaching example of St. Dominic, many people were humbled, setting aside the vanities of jewelry, armor, horses, gold, and silver cups, and similar things. This God showed because when he was yet a nursing child, maybe one year old, he was seen frequently having left his bed to lie down on the ground, showing humility. Also, the world was infected with gluttony. For a few observed Lent, or the fast and wit in the four seasons, the rogation days, or the vigil of saints. St. Dominic gave evidence that he was purified from this infection. For scarcely 10 years old, he already abstained from wine and fasted from on bread and water. Also, the world was infected with avarice, usury, theft, robbery, and deceits. But St. Dominic, by his preaching and through his example, purified it. This is signified by a deed. When he was in Palencia, where there was a great famine, and the poor were dying of starvation, the rich were saying, Let us keep our good for ourselves and our children, because we don't know how long they shall last. But St. Dominic sold his books and furniture and gave it to the poor. His example provoked the rich to give alms. Also about the sin of anger, because the people preferred not to let go of or forgive injuries. They wanted vengeance. St. Dominic came preaching patience, and he made peace. He demonstrated this by his actions. When he was preaching in Caracasona, where there were many heretics, and they were throwing filth and garbage and other things at him, he bore up under it all patiently. And so the world was lazy for spiritual goods. No one cared to be penance, cared to do penance. But St. Dominic showed them by word and example. Three times a day, he disciplined himself with an iron chain. It is clear then that St. Dominic, like salt placed in a new vessel, healed and purified the waters of sin. And so about St. Dominic, it can be understood the word of St. Augustine in the homily. The Lord sent the apostolic salt for the preserving and extinguishing the corruption of the waters of sinners. Preserves from corruption. I say that the second condition of salt is that it preserves from corruption. It isn't just cure and clean what is already corrupt, but it also preserves. This is clear because when a man wishes to preserve meat or fish, he puts salt on them, which absorbs a moisture. Although this is clear, nevertheless, there is a scriptural authority of Tobias, who caught a fish of which he ate a part, and they took it with him in the way. The rest they salted as much as might serve them, till they came to rages the city of Medes. So too of St. Dominic. For I find that this world should have been corrupted and destroyed for well over 200 years and more. But the Virgin Mary, wishing still to preserve the world, put salt on it, namely St. Dominic, and saved the world. For in the stories of the saints and in the life of St. Dominic in two places, we read of a vision which St. Dominic and St. Francis both experienced. When they were in Rome working for the confirmation of their orders, the Pope and Cardinals were raising difficulties over such new things because they were seeking confirmation of a status which was both higher and lower. A higher status because it was both a contemplative life of study and active. By performing spiritual works, by celebrating and preaching, the starving are satisfied with the word of God, and those ignorant in the faith are instructed. And the dead, that is sinners, are buried in the wounds of Christ. The captives of the devil, too, are redeemed. The campaign is engaged. The demons are conquered. Oh, how many castles, sinners, are made subject to Christ by preaching? Secondly, a lower status, because greatly despised, because they were beggars. And so the Pope was not inclined to confirm them, because they could repay nothing. One night, when St. Dominic was praying in a certain church, and St. Francis in another, Christ was seen by them with three lances wishing to destroy the world. These saints were saying to themselves, Oh, shall there be there now no holy one in heaven who can call back this wrath? And suddenly the Virgin Mary came like a mother coming quickly to snatch her child from devouring wolves, saying, Oh, son, you are now bearing lances, you who are accustomed to bearing nails in your hands for the world. Christ replied, Saints Dominic and Francis were listening. My mother how much more should I do? Since I have showered the world with so many graces, I sent the patriarchs and the prophets, and they killed them. And finally, I myself came. History tells how up until now, I have not spared graces. These three lances destructive of the world are the three great tribulations about to come shortly over the world. First is the tribulation and persecution of the Antichrist, which lance can be said that it pierces the whole world. 
Second shall be the conflagration of the world through fire. The whole world is burned. Third is the judicial sentencing of, by Christ. Of these three lances, Scripture testifies allegorically in 2 Kings 18 about Absalom, the traitor and rebel son of David. He was killed by three lances from Joab, the captain of the army. The story says, so he, Joab, took three lances in his hands and thrust them into the heart of Absalom. Why did God wish that Absalom be killed by three lances? Since one would have been sufficient, especially for a man suspended. It was a figure. For the son betraying God the Father is this whole world acting against the commandment of God, expelling their father, namely God from the world as much as possible. But the prince of the army, namely Christ, kills them with three aforesaid lances. Even in the time of St. Dominic, the world ought to have been destroyed by Christ and corrupted. But the Virgin Mary added the salt, namely Dominic, gaining an extension. Think here how the whole world is now in this extension, and we do not have a fixed time. But he said conditionally, if converted, bene, or okay. Otherwise, I shall no longer spare them. Now, let us see if this of the world in these our lands is corrected. I believe that never were there so much pomp and vanities as there are now, nor such lust unless in the time of Noah. For the hotels and even the villas are filled with prostitutes. Mix bad apples with the good and shortly all are rotten. Same for avarice and a usury because they change its name. Usury they falsely call assessments. But when the intention is not buying or selling, but of lending, it is usury. Also not for a just price. Whatever you receive beyond the allotted price is usury and damnation. Same too with simony and the clergy. They ultimately have all the sacraments for sale in some way or another. Same for envy. If someone among religious has some excellence in disputation or the science of preaching, others are envious. It is the same with clergy and lady about gluttony. Already you see the fast of Lent are not observed, nor the vigils of the apostles, nor the rogation days observed. You know about anger. It is already worse against both God and reason. If someone does injury to another and they cannot get to him, contrary to divine law, they kill his innocent friend. For it is against divine and human judgment to kill an innocent person. About sloth the world comes to this, that all are judged to be lazy unless they are doing busyness. But if someone takes some time off from work of God and of prayer, they are called lazy. In the evening of time, it will be apparent who was lazy. And because the world is not corrected, it is even worse. These religious orders who were founded to correct the world are already destroyed. So if Dominic or Francis should come now, they would not recognize their religious orders. Since the world has not been corrected, does it not follow then that in a short time it will be destroyed before the coming of the day of judgment? So for the other objections respond, behold the salt, St. Dominic. On his account, we praise God saying, blessed be the redeemer of all who providing for the salvation of mankind gave St. Dominic to the world. Delights in dining. Third, I say that the other condition of salt is that it gives delight in dining, conferring flavor on food. To make this clear, a quotation. But if the salt loses its savor, it fails in how it salts food. Wherewith shall it be salted? It, the food, is good for nothing anymore to be cast out and to be trodden on by men. The food of the souls are good works and spiritual things. Labor not for the meat which perishes, but for the which endures unto life everlasting. And so Christ says, I have meat to eat, which you know not. The meat of Christ, which satisfies him, are the works of virtue. But this food was insipid before the coming of St. Dominic. The temporal lords, having abandoned the virtues of justice, gave themselves over to tyranny. St. Dominic came salting, recalling them to the virtue of justice, to being content with their returns. The same for insepid meats of prelates, because they cared more about their incomes than about souls. St. Dominic added the salt of his teaching, by which they ought to care more for souls than their incomes. How many religious were living desolate lives, caring nothing of their religious practices? But St. Dominic called them back to religious observance, 
How many irreligious, irreligious clergy praying their divine office only superficially and almost all were cohabitating, prowling the taverns, were led back? How many moneylenders were buying for less than the fixed pence or selling expecting more? How many cruel civil servants permitting the poor to die of starvation were returned to piety, mercy, and liberality? How many self-indulgent women by his preaching did he return to chastity? Finally, God said, Oh, this salt, I wish that it be set on my table. And see how the story is told how Christ appeared to him, inviting him to his glory. Then St. Dominic called 12 brothers in the Bologna convent and before them composed his will such that it was fitting that he leave to his brothers a firm humility and namely that they take pride not because of sanctity or knowledge. Second, he left to his brothers a treasure of poverty by which the kingdom of heaven is purchased. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Third, he bequeaths fraternal charity, and having kissed the brethren and having received the sacraments, he died. They tell the glorious visions which God showed to him of two ladders, of which Christ was holding the top of the first, and the Virgin Mary the other. And crowned with a golden crown, he entered glory. If one asks why two ladders is not one sufficient, the answer is to indicate the order of preachers sins brothers not only by one ladder, namely of the contemplative life, but also the other, namely the way of the active life. The Celestines and those like them ascend by the ladder of contemplation. The Knight of St. John, of St. James, and St. George, and the Brothers of Mercy ascend by the other scale, namely of the active life. But the Brothers of St. Dominic by two, namely the contemplative by study, and the active by preaching, have salt in you, and have peace among you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Okay, that is the sermon of St. Vincent Ferrer on the topic of the of St. Dominic. So hopefully that was beneficial to you. I will do a quick prayer to St. Dominic because, I mean, it's just, it's just right and just. And then I will talk a little bit about the history of St. Dominic, the, his feast anyway, talk a little bit about his spirituality. And then after that, I will also do a few other prayers of St. Dominic that I think are very good. One from Blessed Jordan of Saxony, the second master of the order after St. Dominic, and then maybe do the Litany of St. Dominic. If you've never heard the Litany of St. Dominic, then you are missing out. It's a beautiful prayer. The Novena Prayer to St. Dominic, in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Ghost, amen. O renowned champion of the faith of Christ, most holy Father St. Dominic, look down from that throne of glory where thou enjoyest the reward of thy labors upon me, thy poor unworthy child. I praise and thank God for the exalted decree of sanctity to which he has raised thee, and the special privileges by which he has raised thee, and the special privileges by which he has distinguished thee. And I conjure thee by that gratitude with which thou shalt for all eternity be penetrated to thy divine benefactor, to root out of my heart whatever is not agreeable in his sight, especially that evil habit by which I most frequently offend him. Obtain likewise the, the favors I request in this novena. O glorious mother of God, queen of the sacred rosary, who didst love Dominic with the affection of a mother and wert most tenderly loved and honored by him, vouchsafe to look upon me for his sake with an eye of pity. Deign to join with him in presenting my petitions to the most blessed Jesus, whom I sincerely desire from this moment to love with all my heart and to serve with all my strength. Mother of my Redeemer, I place myself now under thy powerful protection as a certain means of obtaining all necessary grace here and eternal happiness hereafter. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. So the next thing I wanted to talk about was the movement of the Feast of St. Dominic. So here I want to address just something that I found very interesting because, and I will, I will share this in the description below. And if you're watching it later, you can follow along with me and I can pull up this article so y'all can see it with me one moment. This is an article from the New Liturgical Movement. 
the New Liturgical Movement, is a great website for anyone who wants to explore different topics surrounding the traditional Mass. And they, they also have things in the Dominican Rite Mass, the Carmelite Rite Mass, and so on and so forth. But here is an article from the New Liturgical Movement on the Feast of St. Dominic. St. Dominic died on the evening of August the 6th, 1221. And his feast day, so the feast days of saints, are typically celebrated on the feast of, the, of their death, on the anniversary of their death. Because the anniversary of their death is considered the day of their birth into new life, that is heaven. Now, obviously, some of us have to go through purgatory and have to get to heaven. But the saints, typically, the saints are so holy that they go straight to heaven. So, originally, they would have expected for his feast day to be August 6th. However, August 6th was the feast of Pope St. Sixtus II. Pope St. Sixtus II was martyred in 258, and he is named in the canon of the Mass, so he's very important. And during this time, there was the celebration of the Octave of St. Lawrence, who served as deacon, and he was a Roman martyr. And that is a huge feast that there was happening. So they were like, well, we can't do August 6th because then we have to move Pope St. Sixtus II, which is, has precedent of over a thousand years or roughly a thousand years. So instead, they put him on August 5th. So Pope Gregory put him on August 5th, and that was the, the feast day for the Dominican friars for about 300 years. In 1558, Paul IV ordered the general observance of August 5th as the titular feast of Santa Maria Maggior in Rome. That is the Feast of Our Lady of the Snows. And so they pushed it back another day. So it went from, okay, let's do it on the 6th. Oh, wait, that's Pope Sixtus the 6th. Or Pope Sixtus the 2nd, rather. So let's push him back one day to, Mar to the August 5th. And then they were like, okay, well, we're going to celebrate Our Lady of the Snows that day. So let's push it back another day to August 4th. So August 4th, that became the official day uh, later on. It was initially rejected because the order was not about to um, change their tradition for 300 years. And, but eventually, they, in 1603, they finally accepted it. And ever since then, it has been the feast up until the change and the new calendar and the, after the, in the post-Vatican II era. So the reason why in the post-Vatican II era they changed it later on was because St. John Vianney, had died on August the 4th, which was the Feast of St. Dominic. His feast was put on the general calendar, and he was on August 9th, but then they pushed him back to August 8th. I don't know why that happened. I'm not really too—I don't really have a devotion to St. John Vianney, so I don't really know much about him in general. So, and when they changed the calendar, they were like, well, the cure of ours, St. John Vianney, he— was, he died on the 4th. St. Dominic died on the 6th, and we've already moved his feast day twice already. So what would hurt if we just switch it one more time and we stick the cure of ours, St. John Vianney, on the day he died, that would be August 4th, and St. Dominic onto the feast of St. John Vianney, which was now August 8th. So that's what they did. What this author notes, which I find interesting, is that the... Kier of ours himself would have celebrated the feast of St. Dominic on the day he died. And so that's pretty awesome and kind of makes you forget. The author also knows that St. Thomas is another person that they changed his feast day. They moved it from the day he died to the translation of his relics. So he, there's a bunch of other things that I can read here about St. Dominic. I won't bore you with it all, but I will come back to some of these things later on. And I highly recommend, I'll leave in the description, some of these songs and prayers to St. Dominic. This is the O Lumen. I'm not going to play it for you. This is the, uh, this is the sequence for the Feast of St. Dominic. And there's also the O Spem. And those I will link in the description below if you want to hear it. I would play it, but I would probably get copyrighted. So I'm not going to play it. So here is the life of St. Dominic that I think you'll find very interesting. There is uh, this book that I, is called The Dominican Contemplatives by a Dominican of Karis Brook. 
this is the is a is a book about Saint Dominic, but also of just contemplative life among the Dominican friars. Now, this is interesting because it is often said in the 21st century that the Dominicans do not have a spirituality, that there is no Dominican spirituality, which I find to be problematic because it sounds to me when I read about the history of the Dominican order that there is, in fact, a spirituality. In fact, the it's so much so that I have everything I read, they talk about Dominican spirituality, Dominican contemplative life, and how it differs from others. So I'm going to read to you about the contemplative spirit of St. Dominic. Because I think this will be more interesting than about his life. You can find a number of videos on his life on YouTube. So I would highly recommend checking that out. So the contemplative spirit of St. Dominic. Probably no saint in the church calendar brings the work of apostolic labors for souls more vividly to our mind than does St. Dominic. He appears as the very personification of activity and zeal. He is the great preacher, the doctor of truth, the herald of the gospel, the champion of the church. Even his name has something stirring about it, suggestive of the clash of arms. For the good of souls, God willed him to don spiritual armor, to wield the sword of his word. But in other circumstances, it is easy to picture Dominic as a second Simon de Montfort, battling for the Lord rightly, right valiantly. He is a knight by excellence, and it is quite impossible to imagine him anything else. Yet this man was likewise a great contemplative. We may, without hesitation, assign to the founder of the Friar's Preacher a place amongst those who have gone down deepest into the deep things of God and tasted the sweetness of continual and familiar intercourse with him. Attention has many times have been called to St. Dominic's resemblance to our Lord. Nor was this physical alone. Like Jesus, he had long years of silent, hidden preparation for a short period of apostolic ministry. Like him, his nights were passed wholly in the prayer of God. I also like to note that it is believed that St. Dominic was in the image of our Lord in the flesh. I think that's pretty awesome. Of St. Dominic's nine years as a canon regular of Ozma, Blessed Jordan of Saxony speaks as follows. He, like a fl flourishing olive tree and growing cypress, remained day and night in the church, applying himself constantly to prayer and scarcely ever leaving the cloister for fear of shortening the time of contemplation. God had given him a deep sorrow for sinners, for the afflicted and the miserable, who woe, whose woes Dominic enshrined in his inner sanctuary of compassion. And the deep loving sorrow he felt for them was so intense as to seek relief in tears. His almost constant habit was to pass a night in prayer and communion with God. Then came the comparatively short but marvelously fruitful apostolic life. It could no longer be said that he scarcely ever left the cloister for fear of shortening the time of contemplation. For his days were devoted to bringing souls to God by preaching, the ministry of the confessional, and other works of zeal. He was to be found in the high roads of Europe, in the passes of the Alps, in the pyreness of the plains of Lombardy and Long Longuedoc, in the streets of Rome, Bologna, Paris, and many other great cities. But, however, fatigued he might be at the end of a long day's journey, he would press forward hoping to reach some religious house in time to sing matins and in the divine office and prayer throughout the night at the altar's foot. He sought and found rest and refreshment. A wonderful description of this blessed father's vigils has been handed down to us by Thierry de Apolda. It will be noted that he prayed with his whole being, with, the, with both body and soul, and how his prayer was inspired by the words of Holy Scripture. Sometimes he would bow down before the altar, recalling the text of Holy Writ. The prayer of the humble shall pierce the clouds or prostrate full length upon the ground. And he prayed thus, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. An ejaculation which appears to have been a great favorite of him with him. He taught this form of prostration to his son, saying, when the Magi entered Bethlehem and found the child with Mary, his mother falling down, they adored him. We also find that the man God with Mary, come, let us adore and fall down. Let us weep before the Lord who made us. At other times he would stand erect and strike his shoulder with an iron chain, repeating the verse of Psalm 17, Disciplinea Tua. 
Another of his practices was to fix his eyes on the altar, or the crucifix at the same time making numerous genuflections. In this manner, he frequently spent the whole period between Compline and Matins, his intention being to imitate the leper of the gospel, who adored our Lord, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou can make me clean. Sometimes he suspended his genuflections and remained lost in silent contemplation, whilst the tears coursed freely down his cheeks. Again, he would stand before the altar with hands outstretched as though holding a book, or else he raised them as the priest does at Mass. Now and then he covered his eyes as if to meditate more profoundly at certain moments. He seemed to be listening to a mysterious voice. When petitioning some extraordinary favor from God, he extended his arms in the form of a cross. In all these different attitudes, he had the appearance of a prophet conversing with the Most High. It will be seen from his prayer how great a love St. Dominic had for Holy Scriptures. Reading in the inspired word of God with profound reverence and eager delight, he passed from reading to prayer and from prayer to the contemplation of divine truths. Nor did his many long and weary journeys in, interrupt his, con, his, his converse with God. He frequently begged his companions to go on before or to remain a little distance behind, reminding them of the words of us. I will lead her, the soul, into the wilderness, and there I will speak to the heart. Walking alone, he meditated on different passages of scripture, or else when his heart overflowed with holy joy, he would break forth into sacred song the Vene Creator Spiritus and the Ave Marie Stella being most often on his lips. During the process of canonization, one of the witnesses declared that he had never known any man so devoted to prayer as Blessed Dominic. Indeed, he was so convinced of the necessity of continual prayer that he commanded his sons to speak either to God or of God. And how faithfully this injuncture was carried out many carried out may be seen from the lives of the first friars. As to penance, we were told that St. Dominic scourged himself thrice nightly to blood with an iron chain. But apart from such practices, his life was an exceedingly penitential one. He kept the fast and perpetual abstinence with the utmost rigor. He had no cell of his own. The little sleep he allowed himself, he took on the pavement of the church. His journeys were always made on foot and his labors were incessant. Small wonders that even his vigorous constitution rapidly gave way under such severe discipline. St. Dominic's whole life is a demonstration of this truth. Prayer and penance are indispensable to the apostle. The greater his labors, the greater the necessity for him to be steeped in the interior spirit, for unless he possesses God, he cannot give him to others. A modern Dominican was, has well said, a soul filled to overflowing with God is like a furnace glowing with heat and flame. All who approach it become conscious of dazzling brightness and cheering warmth. The order of preachers is the great creation of Dominic's sanctity, and its genius necessarily reflects the spirit and the life of its founder. It might even be described as himself still living, praying, and working in the world. St. Dominic was both a great contemplative and a great apostle. Contemplation and apostolic action are the two fundamental, fundamental principles of his order, closely entwined and dependent on each other. I will leave that there. This is a great book. Highly recommend that you check it out if you ever get the chance. I will try to leave a description of this as well because it's online. So I will leave that there as well if I can find the a link that works because this is a pdf that i downloaded so i have to find the original link to upload it or leave you a link in the description okay so that is a little bit about the prayer of saint dominic saint dominic is such a beautiful and wonderful saint of our times that we need more than ever today it just makes me think when i was reading the sermon of saint vincent ferrer how much we need a saint dominic for our times that we deserve the coming chastisement that our Lord has promised at Fatima, that our lady had promised at Fatima. More than ever, we need that apostolic zeal and we need the help of St. Dominic to be inspired to live an apostolic life, to live purely, but also to preach, to convert sinners. It is said that St. Dominic would leave a puddle of tears at night praying in the chapel. And his prayer was always 
what will become of poor sinners? What will become of poor sinners? He had this apostolic zeal for souls that is so lost today because he realized that these poor sinners would end up damned, would end up in hell if they did not repent. That's a spirit that we need today, a spirit that recognizes that at any moment we could be damned. And so let me encourage you today in this Feast of St. Dominic to have apostolic zeal, to read a life of St. Dominic. I will recommend the one, I forget the name of it, but it's published by Mediatrix Press. Ryan Grant published it with Mediatrix Press. Excellent short biography of St. Dominic. Read the life of St. Dominic. Learn about these mendicant lives. It is a beautiful life of religious vocation. A life that is dedicated to the life of our Lord, to a life of a true preacher, of someone who has a desire to change hearts and minds for the salvation of souls. It's so important. It's so important today. Uh, finally, we'll close out in two prayers, the sequence for the Feast of Holy Father St. Dominic and the Litany of St. Dominic. And I was thinking about doing the Litany of Saints of the Dominican Rite, but that one is very long. So we're not going to do that because it just would be too long. But instead, we'll do the Litany of St. Dominic. Most people have never heard of this. So I thought it'd be kind of cool. And after that, I will close out as normal. And I will leave a link to all the things that we talked about. All the things that I mentioned will all be in the description below. And uh, so I'm going to close out as soon as I finish this. So I'll leave all the uh, description stuff right now. So make sure to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, comment down below. Uh, let me know if you want me to do anything else on St. Dominic's life. I never, I didn't even talk about the rosary. The rosary is like a whole thing that was St. Dominic and I didn't even talk about it. Didn't talk about the life of St. Dominic. There's so many more things that I could have talked about and uh, I did not talk about. So if there is something specific you want me to address, want me to do a video on, leave a comment in the description below. I'd be happy to do so. And finally, uh, make sure to share this with someone that you think will find this interesting. Make sure to share it if, uh, because I think we need this kind of spirit more than ever today. And I will close out with the prayer for the sequence for the Feast of St. Dominic and the Litany of St. Dominic. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, amen. Now new canticle ascending and new strains harmonious blending mid the hierarchies of heaven with our earthly choirs according. Join the festival in louding to our Holy Father given for the welfare, for the welfare of our, of the nations called from Egypt's desolations by their God and maker. He was the chosen one and glorious passing over the way victorious in the ark of poverty. Ere his birth, the preacher's brother is prefigured to his mother by a hound with torch of fire. So her son, his torchlight bearing midst the nation's dark appearing leads them on with, with full desire. He, another Moses teacheth and Elias like he preacheth sin denouncing with his might. Samson, like his foxes sending and the foe, his trumpet rending Gideon, like he put to flight from the death's sleep, a child he waketh whom alive his mother taketh when the holy sign he makes cease the floods and bread from heaven for his fainting sons is given, which into their hands he breaks happy. He whose elevation is our mother's exaltation is he is her joys and well indeed to his home by saints attended hath his soul for a ascended having filled the, uh, the earth with seed like the hidden grain he biddeth. Like the clouded star he hideth, but the maker of the spheres. Joseph's dry bones readorn, readorning will re revel the stars of morning till earth's darkness disappears. O oh, surpassing fragrance telling of the virtues of that dwelling, which within the tomb doth lie. Thither flock the sick for healing, blind and lame the grace revealing that his body lives for our Wherever now with jubilation, fill and praise him every nation, cry aloud and crave his care. Seeing Dominic the glorious, seeing Dominic victorious, claim his help and promise prayer. And thou, Father, kind and loving, shepherd patron unreproving, kneeling heaven's high throne before, 
Lift for us thy voice prevailing, to our King with prayer availing, evermore and evermore. Amen. Alleluia. Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, hear us. Christ, graciously hear us. God, the Father of heaven, have mercy on us. God, the Son, the Redeemer of the world, have mercy on us. God, the Holy Ghost, have mercy on us. Holy Trinity, one God, have mercy on us. Holy Mary, pray for us. Queen of the Holy Rosary, pray for us. Holy Mother of God, pray for us. Our glorious Father, St. Dominic, pray for us. St. Dominic, follower of Jesus Christ, pray for us. St. Dominic, eminently endowed with the virtues of his sacred heart, pray for us. St. Dominic, adorer of the Blessed Sacrament, pray for us. St. Dominic, singularly devoted to our Blessed Lady, pray for us. St. Dominic, promoter of her honor, pray for us. St. Dominic, promulgator of the Holy Rosary, pray for us. St. Dominic, splendor of the priesthood, pray for us. St. Dominic, founder of the Friars Preachers, pray for us. St. Dominic, apostle of the Albigensians, pray for us. St. Dominic, mirror of ecclesiastical discipline, pray for us. St. Dominic, rose of patience, pray for us. St. Dominic, most ardent for the salvation of souls, pray for us. St. Dominic, most desirous of martyrdom, pray for us. St. Dominic, evangelical man, pray for us. St. Dominic, doctor of truth, pray for us. St. Dominic, ivory of chastity, pray for us. St. Dominic, man of truly apostolic heart, pray for us. St. Dominic, poor in the midst of riches, pray for us. St. Dominic, rich in an unspotted life, pray for us. St. Dominic, burning with zeal for perishing souls, pray for us. St. Dominic, preacher of the gospel, pray for us. St. Dominic, rule of abstinence, pray for us. St. Dominic, herald of heavenly things, pray for us. St. Dominic, salt of the earth, pray for us. St. Dominic, who didst water the earth with thy blood, pray for us. St. Dominic, shining in the choir of virgins, pray for us. St. Dominic, most humble, pray for us. St. Dominic, most obedient, pray for us. St. Dominic, most chaste, pray for us. St. Dominic, most charitable, pray for us. That at the hour of death we may be received unto heaven with thee, pray for us. Be merciful unto us, O Lord, and pardon us. Be merciful unto us, O Lord, and graciously hear us. From all sin and evil, deliver us, O Lord. From the snares of the devil, deliver us, O Lord. From eternal death, deliver us, O Lord. By the merits of our Holy Father, St. Dominic, deliver us, O Lord. By his ardent love, deliver us, O Lord. By his indefatigable zeal, deliver us, O Lord. By his extraordinary labors, deliver us, O Lord. By his inexpressible penances, deliver us, O Lord. By his voluntary poverty, deliver us, O Lord. By his perpetual chastity, deliver us, O Lord. By his perfect obedience, deliver us, O Lord. By his profound humility, deliver us, O Lord. By his rare constancy, deliver us, O Lord. By all his other virtues, deliver us, O Lord. Lamb of God, who take us away the sins of the world, spare us, O Lord. Lamb of God, who take us away the sins of the world, hear us, O Lord. Lamb of God, who take us away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Pray for us, O blessed Father St. Dominic, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray, grant, we beseech thee, O Lord, that we, thy servants, may enjoy continual health of mind and body, and that through the glorious intercession of Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, we may be delivered from present sorrow, and hereafter enjoy everlasting happiness through Christ our Lord. Amen. I know I said that, that was going to be the last one, but I forgot I wanted to do the prayer attributed to Blessed Jordan of Saxony, to St. Dominic. O blessed Father St. Dominic, holy priest of God, beloved confessor, renowned preacher, man of the Lord's own choosing. In your day, you were pleased and beloved of the Lord above all others, glorious in your life, teaching and miracles. We rejoice to have you as our gracious advocate before the Lord God. I cry to you from the depths of this vale of tears, because I venerate you among all the saintly elect of God. With particular devotion, merciful Father, help, I pray, my sinful soul, so destitute of all grace and virtue, so covered with the stains of many sins and vices. Come to my wretched and unhappy soul, thou happy and blessed soul of the man of God, endowed with such blessings by divine grace. Not only has it raised you to happy peace, quiet rest, and heavenly glory, but by your praiseworthy life, it has drawn uncounted others to the same happiness. It has incited them with your sweet admonition, instructed them with your winning teaching, and aroused them with your fervent preaching. 
Be attentive then, O blessed Dominic, and bend a merciful ear to my pleading voice. Turning to you, my poor and needy soul falls at your feet. As far as in humble mind it can, it sluggishly labors to place itself before you. As in living death, my soul strives with all its powers to pray to you. It begs through your powerful merits and virtuous prayers that you will kindly restore it to life and health and fill it with the ample gift of your blessing. For I know, truly know, that you can do it. I am certain of it. From your great charity, I am confident that you want this. I hope from the immense mercy of the Savior that you can bring about before him whatever you wish. I rely too on your great friendship with Jesus Christ, so loved by you whom you chose out of 10,000. It is my hope that he will deny you nothing. Rather, that whatever you ask, you will get from him. For though he is a Lord God, yet he is your friend. What could he deny to you who put all else aside and did not hesitate to give yourself and all you had to him? This is why we speak as we do. This is why we have great veneration for you. In the full flowering of your manhood, you dedicated your virginity to the radiant spouse of all virgins. White robed from baptism's sacred font, adorned by the Holy Spirit, you vowed your soul and chaste love to the King of Kings. After long training in the combat of the regular life, you set your heart on still higher goal. You grew from virtue to virtue. You went always from what was merely good to what was better. You offered your body as a living victim, holy and pleasing to God. Formed of the divine plan, you consecrated your whole self to God alone, undertaking the way of perfection and left all things and stripped followed the poor Christ, preferring heaven's treasure to those of the earth. Denying yourself vigorously, you manfully took up your cross, successfully tried to follow in the footstep of our Redeemer as your true captain. Your strong love burned with heavenly fire and godlike zeal. With all the fervor of an impetuous heart and with an avowal of perfect poverty, you spent the whole self in the cause of the apostolic life. To further this work, you established the order of preachers, guided from the beginning by counsel from on high. You brightened Holy Mother Church through the world of men with your glorious merits and example. At last, you left behind this bondage of the flesh, taken up into heaven's army. You rose to the heights of glory. And now I pray that you, who wanted the salvation of the human race, with tremendous zeal, will come to help me and those I hold dear. I pray too for all mankind, the clergy, the people, religious women. After the blessed queen of virgins, you are my sweet hope and solace. Before all other saints, you are my special refuge. Bend favorably to help me. You are the one to whom I fly. You alone do I dare approach. I put myself at your feet. I invoke you as my patron. I implore and devoutly commend, commend myself to you. I ask you kindly and favorably receive, keep, protect, and help me. May I thereby merit receiving from God, through your intercession, the grace I desire, finding mercy and salvation's remedy now and hereafter. O oh, blessed Dominic, master, famous captain, loving father, so may it be, so let your prayers obtain. Then come to me, I pray, and to all who call on you. Be truly for us the Lord's own, as your name implies, the watchful keeper of his flock. Keep and rule us who are committed to your care at all times. Make our way straight and reconcile us with God. Then after this, our exile, joyfully present us to the blessed Lord, God's dearly loved Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ whose honor, praise, glory, unutterable joy, and eternal happiness, together with that of the glorious Virgin Mary and the whole company of heaven's citizens, endure without end forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.